okay? <laughs> Let me show you what, what it says here. See that first word up there where it's before 1 Timothy 1.19? What does it say? So, so in the Bible, what's this? We're just going to highlight this and go, so i got a long way to go here, okay? So, so what in, in, the, in the Scripture, New Testament Scripture, it says this about describing our conscience. Here it is. It's good. It's good. Next, Joe. Then it says, it's clear. Next. It's blameless. Now see, we take, we can stop right there, and that would be a good place to end this sermon, right? So follow your conscience, and then you're going to be good, you're going to be clear, you're going to be blameless. If you'll follow this, and stay with this, it's, you got it. And in a perfect world, that's true. That's what God intended. Something happened. And then, watch what happens. Then it says, our conscience is weak. Uh -oh. Then it says, it's defiled. In other words, something came in, a disease came in that defiles that conscience of God into. And then finally, it's evil. <laughs> what happened to good? And, and now it's evil? Keep going. One more thing. Yeah, yeah see. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that again. See if it's been burnt. It's been deformed. It's been desensitized. Okay, now, now, now look up here. My goodness. All these descriptions of our consciousness. Yeah, I'm a little confused now, right? It's good. It's clear, it's blameless, it's evil, it's it's seared. <coughs> also, why why is the New Testament just all over the map on this word here? Why why can't we be really clear with this? It's just all over the map. Okay. Any answers? It's word of prayer. Okay, I'll take it. Just like everything else in our life. Here it is. It's like everything else in our life, your conscience can be formed by your sin nature. Yes. There it is. Your conscience can be formed by your sin nature. Let me use some scripture verses here. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, you know this. This is talking about our sin nature. Okay? We, we have a sin nature. The Bible says that all of sin, what? Come on, church. You know, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not God's intention that we sin. That we fall short because why? We have chosen that sin, right? So something has invaded God's divine plan that we've talked about like, two weeks ago. The last time we met God's blueprint. Right? Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spreads to who? All, all men. Because what? All we've all sinned. Okay? So that's our death sentence, but it's also... It's just our sin nature. We all have that sin nature in this room. Sorry. You know, we do. Then he goes on to say in Romans uh, 7, 22. This is for I delight in the Lord. In other words, in my inner being. In my, in my deep inner being, I really want to do what's right. Everybody kind of with me on that? Yes. You know, you want to do, you're not, I mean, you kind of this morning came to church. I mean, you want to do something right. Right? See, if you came to church and said, man, maybe this guy can help me today through the Word of God, and I'm trying. And so here's, here it is. We want to do what's right in our life, but we realize we don't do what's right all the time. And in my inner being, I, I know what's right sometimes, and I know what I, I should do, but I, I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. That sounds familiar with Paul, right? Here's what he says. I delight. I mean, I don't really want to do this, but... But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of what? Sin that dwells in my members. In other words, dwells in the things that I do. The parts of me. So here's what Paul is saying. There is a war that's going on within him. Now Paul, remember who Paul was? Great man of God. Instrument of writing most of the New Testament. Completely sold out. And he's got this war going on in this inner man, in his conscience. He's got this, he says, I know what's right sometimes, and then I don't know what's right. I, I want to do this, but I don't do this, and sometimes I do it. And I've got this war going on over and over and over. If 
we don't we don't have this here, but in between that first person we read and those verses in the middle, it's right and stuck in the middle of this thing is this war is is a battle zone and it's continual and it's happening every day in my life that I have to wage this war of my inner being, of my conscience, of the what decisions that I make. It's a war, and I struggle, and I struggle, and I struggle with this. And this is what Paul is saying. But then in verse 25, I don't know if you have Bible there, we don't have that up there, but in verse 25, here's what Paul said. He says, but Jesus has won the victory over this battle that I'm facing. In other words, I'm going to be fighting this, I'm going to be struggling in this, and, and, but, but I know this, that my victory is found in Jesus Christ and I'm going to trust Him in my life ultimately. But I'm still going to struggle. My goodness, no way in after that. Amen. I say amen to that. He's won the victory. So, so, so if I know there's a struggle and I know there's a victor, what side do you think I want to choose? Do you want to choose the losing side, church? We want to choose this, this victory. And Paul says, I struggle and I struggle and I struggle and I struggle. But I know. Check this out. Because of my sin nature, your sin nature, since what is right and wrong because, what's this?
And here's what happens sometimes. What happens is that we, we, once we start this, and, 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 and because of our sin nature, we distort it with what is right. What is wrong? The second thing that I notice here is because of our sin nature, our sense of right and wrong is dead. First Timothy. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Now the Spirit expressively says that the in latter day, in latter days, in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching demons. <coughs> Though the insincerity of liars whose conscience are what? Seared. Seared. Ignoring what is right and wrong, sin begins to rule. And like what it says, like taking a hot iron and press and pressing on your skin, it kills that skin tissue. Have you ever had burns so bad that that uh, later when it heals over, you can touch that and there's no feelings there? There's no sense about it. You can't feel that. You know the pressure or even a, a prick there. You just can't you can't feel that. And that's exactly what that scripture verse is saying. That, that once you embrace that, in fact, in latter days, there's a, that sense of lies, sense of deception will come. The spirit of uh, disillusionment uh, and it comes and it, there's a confusion there and you don't know what's right or wrong and there's a you lose that sense of what what that inner spirit talks about to you. I was watching a documentary the other day of World War II and it was talking about just the just the unbelievable things that happened in these prison camps and and the in the thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that were executed under under Hitler's regime. And I, and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, as I started watching this, I see these German soldiers, and they're, they're implementing these death sentences over thousands and thousands of people, whether they're shot or gas chambers, or put them on these trains and headed to their, to their destination of death. And I thought, how did these soldiers handle the guilt? I mean, how did they handle that? I mean, can you imagine looking at the faces of people? Yeah, you're, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. Children and women and men. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> I don't think so. And then, I, I, they made a quote. They, they gave a quote at the end of this thing. In Hitler. And here's what Hitler said concerning that. Here, here's what he said. He said this. He said, I freed Germany from the stupid, degrading, fallacies of a conscience <clears throat> and morality. We will train young people before whom the world will tremble. I will young people capable of violence and perilous, relentless, and cruel. Sir, one man said, I will take the young people and I will change, I will sear, I will take that hot iron and change their way of thinking of morality, their sense of consciousness. So you tell me your conscience cannot be changed and altered, as we talked about, like a thermostat, it can be. So here's what Hitler did. He took young people. He said, give me young people, I'll change the world. And that's what he tried to do. I heard a quote one time, the worst sin is the consciousness of no sin at all. That's the worst thing. So here's the question. Hey, let's play your minutes. So here's the question. So if your conscience is so undependable, what is it good for, right? We just said that God has created that and formed this in us. He's the one that put that there. So, so isn't there something good about that? Absolutely. Understand that it was given to you by God for a purpose. And it was intended from the very beginning to be like an early warning signal in simple parts. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The Spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord, searching all the Lord's parts. And second, remember that your conscience can be easily reset. Check this out. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to with my whole heart I will seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not want. See, it can be reset. 
Only by the power and the authority of God in your life can you receive that. Sometimes we just get so confused with this and so manipulated by others and how we view our friends. It's so very, very cautious that we make sure our friends are not influencing us and changing that. So how do we do that? Here it is. How do we get to where our conscience is in good standing to make everyday choices? I'm going to give you three things in the world at all. All right? First of all, is it? Here it is. We have to be cleansed by Christ's blood. How do we handle the guilt of conscience? Man, if you look at society, there's many different ways, isn't there? In Mexico, you know what they do for guilt of conscience? They climb up a steep hill on their hands and knees. And it's a bloody mess to get rid of their guilty conscience. Other people just get very religious, don't they? Maybe that's how you can handle your, your guilty conscience. I'm just going to get religious. I'm going to go to church every Sunday. I'm going to hang out with Christian people. I'm going to watch uh, TV all the time. I'm going to turn that stuff off. I'm just going to get really, really, really religious. Well, good luck with that. May have for a while, but eventually it comes back. There's only one way to do that, church. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ, the redeeming work of Christ. That is the only way. It's only through the blood of Christ that we're ever going to have a remission and cleansing of our sin. That's it. And so, so the way that we can handle this is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me show you the Hebrews. For if the blood of goats, bulls, and the sprinkling of the foul person with the ashes of heaven sanctified for the purification of flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ do through the eternal spirit offered itself without blemish to God? Purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. You see that? It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we have this. In fact, if you, if you read in, uh, in uh, I think that's, uh, I don't think I have that one uh, it's uh, Hebrews 10, verse 22. It says that the only way that we're going to have this forgiveness and the cleansing is through the blood of Jesus Christ as we plead the blood. And I love that. You know, if you grow up in old time religion, remember to plead the blood? You know, I'm going to plead the blood on your that, That's Some people go, plead the blood. You know, and, and that's just going back to a basic principle that the only way we're going to have forgiveness. The only way we're going to have redemption, the only way we're going to have a change of heart, a cleansing of our guilty conscience, is through the blood of Jesus. Remember we sang that song, Are You Washed in the Blood of Jesus? We just sang that song. You know, y'all sang it just while ago. Did you not agree with that? Absolutely. And that's where we have to start. So it's not about being religious, it's, it's not about praying more. We start with the blood of Jesus. We start there, and we stand before God through the blood of Jesus Christ that we have everlasting life. We start with our beginning with Christ, and that's where we end. The fullness of Christ and His blood. Second, we have to be corrected by Christ's word. By Christ's word. I wrote a story about a factory worker. And his job, one of his job, was to sound the factory's whistle. He did that at 7 to start the day, 12 for lunch, and 4 o'clock in the day. And that was his duty. He did it for years. And the way that he did that to make sure it was very precise, because they defended him only at 7 and 12 and 4, that as he walked to the factory each day, he passed by a, a jewelry shop. And there in the jewelry shop, in the very front of the store, was, was a clock there. And he would look at his watch and pull it out of his pocket, and he would set it to the clock that was in the jewelry store. He did for years and years. Finally, one day he stopped in to the store owner and he asked him, he said, how, how do you get the correct time every day? I mean, you, you've got the correct time every day. He said, well, I go by the, the whistle at the back. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of what we do, don't we? <laughs> how do you handle that? Okay. If you're not like, well, you handle it, I'll go find somebody else. That's kind of what we do. Is there a better way to set our spiritual thoughts? I think so. I don't know work out. I'm sure this is a This is probably one of my favorite verses. Um, when 
the senior graduates, I've been doing this for 20 plus years, the senior graduates in, in the church, we give them a Bible, and this is the verse that I write in the front of everybody. All scriptures agree by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Why how's that through the word of God? Amen. Big church, come on. Listen. We began by asking the cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we take action on what he did, what he says. And we look to the word of God for our instruction. To give us correction and truth in all things. And finally, the last thing is we've got something very pliable here, and that's the last point. Right here. Third, we have the counsel of God's Spirit. The counsel of God's Spirit. Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, He said this, He said, you know, I, I'm, I'm leaving you guys, but, but understand this. I'm leaving with you, you know, He's going to walk with you. And, and by the way, the world's not going to see this, and they're not going to believe this, and they're not going to understand this, because they don't have the Holy Spirit teaching them direction. And so when Jesus said this, He saw where we are today. He said, the rest of the world, their standard is going to be no absolutes. Do what you want to do. Do what you feel. And Jesus says, He says very clearly, you're not going to be of the world. Because you're going to have this inner man speaking to you, led by the Spirit of God, giving you directions of what you're to do and guidance and counsel with you. Not only as a comforter, but also to teach you in all things and to point you around. The rest of the world will not have this, and there's going to be confusion there, but you will have that. Not only will you have that, but you will live in you. And there's that conscious of what Jesus is talking to them. You will have that. Let me give a final summation of See, if we're left to ourselves, just to ourselves, only depending on the ideal that our conscience is our guide, then we're going to set it the way that we think what is right or good. Because nobody likes a guilty conscience. You want to sleep in that, right? And so what we're going to take, we're going to take that, if we're left to ourselves, we're going to determine what is hot, and what is cold, what is good, what is right, what, how we're going to handle it, how this kind of, I'm not sure about that. And so we're going to adjust it to whatever we if we're left to ourselves, right? Right? Yes. Scripture says over and over, and God turned them over to himself. And they held up this, okay. They did whatever they thought was right. For eternity, they have rejected God's standard as well. So the answer? God has given us this inner flashlight, this conscience. And it warns us. If we have this clear guidance that through Christ we've been cleansed to walk a life that is pure and holy and <coughs> avoiding guilt simply because of the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives us. And then God says that I've given you my word that teaches you, instructs you. If you'll follow the word of God, you'll have that direction. And then finally, not only that, you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live that life if you trust me. Left to ourselves, will be misguided. If you trust the Lord, I promise you this, that He will guide us in His way. And He'll lead us into a path that is righteous and holy, so that one day when we stand before Him, isn't that the, the key, that when we stand before Him, that it will not be that we did the best we could with what we had. It will all be because of what Jesus did on Calvary that cleansed us, that empowered us to live a life that is pleasing. And he'll announce to all of the angels, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay. Amen? Amen. Good grace thing ever, would you? Let's pray. Amen.
Well, um, so glad you didn't leave it up to us to figure this out. Because we're dangerous. <coughs> Lord, you didn't leave it up to us to depend on our own self, our own sense of what's right or wrong. Lord, you gave us something. Because we've seen it, it's just kind of got mixed up in the process here. So today we discovered together the Lord that we ask that we have this clear conscience. That somewhere in, in our mind, in our inner being, that through the blood of Jesus Christ that we've been cleansed and through God's Word and the Spirit of God that we can make these day-to-day -day decisions be directed that would please you. Lord, forgive us when we've just gone through life and we just say we did the best we can. And could we just not stop today and just kind of give this thermostat check to where it's set in our lives. And to be honest enough to, that you correct us where we just kind of turned it away that is contrary to really what's right. Lord, I thank you for how we can confess our sins and you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. In other words, you give us a new starting block for that we're grateful. The Lord, after we enter the race, we see this battle of things that are raging in us. We don't know right or wrong, but you said you're not going to leave us to ourselves, but you're going to give us the presence of the Holy Spirit. In God's word to God. So Lord, I pray for the people here that today that we sense that and, and we embrace that, that we can start again, we can reset. We thank you that we can be forgiven, we have your word, and we have your spirit and powers to do that. What a great way to start next week. A new beginning. Lord, we love you today. I thank you for those that are here. May the Spirit of the Lord bless them and enrich them. We thank you for this time of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, bless you. If uh, you're a believer in Christ, we uh, welcome you for this place.
you can catch up with us. This morning, what we're going to do, we're going to take it just a little deeper here. Uh, I had some comments that uh, I was meddling last week, and so now I'm really going to meddle with your life. Because we're going to be really looking at today's question is, how, how do you make the day-to-day -day moral decisions of your life? It's one thing to take major decisions and evaluate it and determine it and use all the evidence. But how do we day by day by day, Monday through Sunday, make these little decisions in our life? Just, just the practical decision things that you make. What are some of the ways that you make those decisions? Now let me ask you a question before you answer that. Especially in the sense of morality and ethics and trying to, to follow Christ as best you can and His teaching. Wouldn't you not agree that, that in America today we're in this moral fog? Would you not agree? Amen. It just seems that uh, the more and more that, that you hear our American culture, it seems like we're just in this fog of how to make these everyday decisions. In fact, we've, we've kind of looked at it in a way that, well, you know, uh, what's right, right or wrong, it's really according to how you feel about what is right, and what is wrong. What may be right for somebody may not be right for another person. And what is wrong for somebody might not be wrong for another person. You know what I'm saying? In other words, what we've said here in America, there are no absolutes. No absolutes. There's no right. There's no wrong. If it feels good, what? Do it. Just go with your gut feelings and you'll work it out somehow. Somewhere along the line you'll get it right. And it really doesn't matter because however you determine to do that, it's probably right for you, but it may not be right for me. And so we live in this, this moral fog of decision making, a lot day to day type of uh, things that we uh, have to come about. And so a lot of times we hear this, especially in the realms of spirituality and making these day to day decisions is, we say this, well, just let your conscience, what? Be your guide. So really what that says, there's, there's this kind of a, a code, a biblical spiritual code, that somewhere along the line we have this conscience that God has put, us, uh, that God has put in us, and, and that's going to kind of be our, uh, the way that we determine how to make decisions. Let your conscience be your guide. Let, some, let, let that inner voice speak to you. Let that inner voice guide you. And a lot of times we go with that. Now, is that right or wrong? Well, we're going to be looking at that this morning before you answer. So the title of this myth buster is Let Your Conscience Be Your Guide. Now, where do we get this myth? We're going to look at this. And, and this is going to be a tough one today. Okay, man, i got a ton of notes here. We're going to be out by two, I promise you. <laughs> And it's going to be kind of tough because it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of gray here. But, but I hope I can describe it that you can get a good grip on this thing because I don't want to teach you a lot. There's a lot of teaching today, and so uh, I hope you got your, te uh, your uh, teaching hats on. And kind of go Here's where we kind of got this myth, 1940. Uh, you ever heard the movie Pinocchio? Yeah. You remember Jimmy Cricket? You know, yeah, there it is. Jimmy Cricket comes to our hero, uh, Pinocchio, and Jimmy Cricket sings a song to Pinocchio, and it says, Take the straight and narrow path, and if you start to slide, just what? Give a little whistle, give a little whistle, and always what? Let your conscience be your guide. Well, actually, probably didn't, it probably really didn't come from there. About uh, 1,300 years before that, we have recorded history about uh, uh, Al Kakadab. He was Al Kakadab was uh, the father of one of the wives of Muhammad. And after uh, he was involved in this crusade, and after they had conquered Jerusalem, and he was headed back to Medea, he gave a speech to his men. And here's the speech that he gave. And he says, "And speak the truth, and do not hesitate to say what you consider to be the truth." That's kind of an interesting statement. Say what you feel. So you know what? I, I, that earlier when we were talking about this moral, American moral fog here, it existed way before we ever thought we could. And notice what he said here. Say what you feel, and then what does it say? Let your... Anyway, wherever this myth, this saying took place, or wherever it is, the, the, the gist of this whole thing is, 
It says, listen, the idea that following your conscience is not only a good thing, but it is the very source that will always give you direction and always point to what is right and what is wrong. And that's the idea with this statement, let your conscience be your guide. Because they will always direct you into truth and it will always direct you into what's right. Well, I think that's some misguided reasoning that we've been taught. Let me kind of break this down for you. There's going to be a lot of teaching here, so I hope you, uh, uh, you're able to uh, kind of handle some of this. I'm sure you are because you all are highly educated. When we were in seminary, they taught us uh, that we should always uh, teach and preach on the 8th grade level. And so uh, I'm, I'm, that's just a warning here. So if you don't get it, I'll let you determine how that answers there. But okay, it, took me, it took me a long time to write this, so that tells you where I'm at too. So here's some misguided reasoning that I want to add to this to kind of help us understand where we're going to go with this. Here's some misguided reasoning with this idea of allowing your conscience to be your guide. First of all, it says completely trust your conscience as God given internal indicator of what is right and what is wrong. In other words, as you operate on today by day by day, making these decisions, it's, it's really just listening to your gut. It's kind of thinking about before you make a decision, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. Maybe you don't even check that, but, but basically this idea is somewhere in you, you've got this way to make decision making, and it's in you, so just go with it. But there's no way to check the validity other than the fact that you kind of feel good about that decision and you just go with it. And that's that idea of allowing your conscience to be your guide. Honestly, there's some truth to that, but we'll soon discover that there's some fallacy with that also. Secondly, if you have peace about something, a decision, an action, in other words, there's an absence of guilt, then you must assume it's okay, right? Surely, most of us want to make good decisions in this place day to day, right? And so when we make a bad decision, what happens? There's a guilt trip, right? We all may not believe that. What was I thinking? And I think we have that. So a lot of times, on the reverse side of that, is as we make these decisions and as we take action on things, we do these things, if there's an absence of guilt, it must be a good decision, right? <laughs> see, see the dilemma we're facing here? So if there's an absence of guilt, there's a good feeling about this, and it, I, I didn't notice anything wrong with that, then surely that was a good decision and, and I, my conscience is very clear. So I'm talking bad about someone and they really are just telling me the truth. So I don't feel bad about that. Or maybe I didn't tell that vulgar joke, but I sure listened to it, but I didn't tell it, so I guess that's okay. I really think bad about somebody, but I really could have thought worse about them. So I don't have that guilty conscience that I could have thought worse. But I only thought just a little bit about that. Do you hear what I'm saying with that? Y'all can get this? Yes. 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 Amen. And so somewhere along the way, we've got some misguided reason here with this because it really doesn't work. Because if I don't have guilt with this, I must be okay. It's kind of like a, a, a GPS. Most of us have GPS on our phone or in your car, and it kind of gives direction with that. And our, our conscience is kind of like this uh, GPS, you know, that we kind of listen to that voice. Last yesterday, we were going to Grayson Special Olympic, where he won the gold medal and the silver medal. Oh. And then he goes to the prom and dances all that long. But I'm following that GPS, and yeah. you know we all have that, and, and, and we know the destination. The boy took us kind of a weird road, but we got there, right? So yeah. everything's good. And that's kind of like our consciences. If we kind of get there, we kind of listen to this kind of this thing that's kind of that, that nagging or lady's voice that goes, "You got to turn here. You made a big mistake. Turn around." You know that voice that kind of does that. I heard this story about a lady in Belgium, and she had a GPS, and she 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 it was a new gift from from her kids, and. She took this trip and she plugged in the information and she drove 800 miles and she was lost the whole time. And they asked her, said, well, didn't you realize you were lost? And she said this, I was so distracted 
about that voice that told me where to go, I didn't realize I was wrong. Now, I, I think that could be when we think that our conscience is the GPS, we could get lost because we keep hearing that voice, and it could be misinformation that we plugged in there. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. And so, really, if we've got peace about, if we got, if we don't have guilt about something, so it's okay, just not true. In fact, Jesus said a lot about that. He said, look, if you lust in your heart, you've what? Committed adultery. If you have hated somebody in your heart, you have committed murder. New GPS information right there. Right? Okay. This, so if we've got this guided information, let's have some redirection, reasoning here, some new information here. Let me give, give, give you a couple of things here. Two of them I'm going to tie together. First of all is this. The idea that your conscience is completely trustworthy, moral guide, is a myth based on a faulty assumption. Just the fact, this, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of really the role of our conscience that's been given to us by God Himself. So we've got a misunderstanding here, and we're going to get to find that what the Bible says in just a few moments. And, and so the myth is, I can treat my conscience and I can trust it at all times. That's the myth. The second thing that I want to say, some, some, some redirection of this reasoning here, is that your conscience often doesn't tell you that you're violating God's standard, but sometimes our conscience only tells us that we're violating our own standard or our own estimate of what is right and what is wrong. You kind of understand that? Kind of redo that just for a second, okay? Sometimes our conscience doesn't tell us of what really God's standard is, but really what our conscience is telling us is that we violated maybe a personal principle that we initiated. That one. I want to tie that next one, that one into the next one here, Joe. Put that one up there. Your conscience can be reset for your convenience Amen. and your comfort. Amen. Uh oh. Now yeah, we're getting into trouble, aren't we? Because we adjust the way we feel about things based on our comfort, based on our direction. I want to give you an illustration to kind of understand this. And this is going to help you understand what I'm trying to go with this, this understanding about this myth about allowing your conscience to be your guide and to be your guide in all things that you can trust in all the time. I want to kind of illustrate this by saying this. A, a thermometer. You don't know what a thermometer is, right? You stick this thermometer into something, and it tells you what? It tells you the temperature. And that's the way sometimes we look at our conscience. We look at, like, we, we're not sure about something, so we just kind of stick it in there. We read that, and we say, well, that's hot. That means I better stay away from it. Or that's cold. I'm not sure about that. Or if it's just right, well, then we're going to go with it. And we just kind of measure that thing, right? And so we take our consciousness, and we, we say, well, that's right, and that's wrong, based on whether we feel hot or Cold, in other words, what's right or wrong, and we determine it, we just stick it in there and say, well, I feel this way about it, so I'm going to plug it in there, and that works for me. I read this, it says, looks good to me, I'm good to go, let's go, right? Yeah. But in reality, the way we really do it is different than a thermometer. It's really our conscience is a thermostat. I don't know what thermostat is, right? Yeah. See, a thermostat really isn't, determines what is hot or cold. What a thermostat is made for is you can determine what is hot and cold by what? Just moving that lever back and forth. And so what is comfortable for me may not be comfortable for you, but I can just move it there for me, and you may go, well, that's not comfortable for me. Do you understand what that is? And so sometimes we can't determine it. Let me kind of give you an illustration. We, uh, we have uh, two, two thermostats in our house. One controls one half of the house, one controls the other half. After having knee surgery, I, I, I've not slept, you know, just a lack of sleep for, for, for weeks and weeks, but, you know, and, and you know this well, don't you? So, and, so, um, and so we did everything we did, and so she read this article and said that if it's really cold at night, you will sleep better. Have you all ever heard that one? Yeah. Yeah. So she said it at 38. <laughs> milk out and put it in our room. <laughs> Frozen food is in our room. I'm so I said, hey, 
that's just that's just too cold. And she goes, well, we have to sleep though. We're not going to now. And so, and so I would fudge it up a little bit. Sorry, I'm telling you this. Now. I would fudge it up or not, you know, a little bit. You know, and I said, man, it's hot in here. Well, I don't know. You know? <laughs> and you know, so for my comfort, it was just a little too cold for me. And so, you know, so, so, so we had this thermostat tug of war, you know, <laughs> go back and forth here. And so, so being the man in the house now, it's still 38. You know? <laughs> Something wrong about Amen. the way that I think about myself. 
Now, that's what Paul talking about there. So if the Apostle Paul says that, that we really can't trust the way we feel about things. We need something else that's guiding us besides ourselves. Then we must look at this the way this. And there's a lot of reasons why he said that. We're going to look at some of those, okay? So here's the question we got to ask you, okay? We're going to be a little confusing here, so hang with me here. Can, your, can you let your conscience be your God? No. Here's the answer. No. Yes. Sorry. And no. How many of y'all confused now? I'm raising my hands because I have no idea where I'm going. Yeah. I just, I just kind of contradicted myself. Yeah, yes and no. I'm going to explain the yes, okay? First of all is this. Your conscience was formed by God. Uh-oh. Everything God forms is for His good pleasure, right? And every good gift comes from Him. And all gifts come from Him. Everything they form was good, right? Now, things have made a twist because of, we'll look at that later, man's deprivation of sin on the sin nature. But everything God forms and creates is what? Is good. It's good. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. Check this out. Spirit of man, in other words, that's that inner man, that thing that helps make decisions. The spirit of man is, is the lamp of the Lord, searching in all his innermost parts. In other words, that conscience that we have is something like a, a search line that's given by God to everyone. And th think of it this way. All societies, okay, check this out, watch this. All societies have ruled against killing and stealing, right? And even though perhaps they don't know what the Bible says, but in all society, there's this rule that it's you shouldn't kill somebody, you shouldn't steal from them. And where did they get, get this? It's that God-given interbeing, that, that, that search lamp that God gives everyone to kind of have that. What if you didn't get that? Can you imagine what our world would be today? Much like it is today. But overall, if we didn't have that sense of something's right or something wrong, especially of killing somebody or stealing from somebody, what would, would it be at all times? It would be chaotic, wouldn't it? All right, so, so some type of order was given to us, and God has given that. Now, in, in the Old Testament, there's not a Hebrew word, but in the New Testament, we, we see the word here. We're going to kind of look at that. It's called the son Thedias, which is uh, knowing within yourself. Let me kind of give you some examples of this, okay? You remember Adam and Eve? Yes. Okay. Okay, Adam and Eve, you remember them? You remember what happened to them? They sinned against God. And when they sinned against God, what did they do? They, all of a sudden they realized they were what? They were naked. And they were, and they were afraid. And so, so immediately, because, you know, no one told them they were naked, what a big deal. And so all of a sudden they go, man, what, what, what's this about? And so they clothed themselves. And then Bob said they were afraid, you know, because God, you know, because they broke the rule there. So they hid themselves from God. So all of a sudden, something happened within them when they broke the rule that caused them later. We made a mistake, and so they were, <coughs> and they hid themselves from God. How about Cain and Abel? Remember that story? Cain killed Abel. Is that right? Cain killed Abel. I was getting back to so Abel killed Abel. One of the guys killed each other, one of the other guys, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, this is before the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And Cain realized what he'd done on his own. So somewhere along the line, we see this, this thematicness of the uh, consciousness in the Old Testament that, that, uh, that shows up. Now, let me show you something here. Look, look at that next statement, Joe. So God formed your knowing within yourself, that, that, that Greek word of, of conscience. For two reasons to the point of, to show his existence. Let me show you what that means. First of all, an eternal witness. Talking about the creation. You know, God created this integral universe. Perfectly formed and right. It's just, it just blows you away if you're really a, a, a student of, of just uh, of, you know, the creation and you know, life and all that. It's just amazing. Just your body alone is just amazing that it works, right? And if you look outside your body and, and the stars in the universe, the scripture says that if you, if you don't know God, just look at the universe and you know there's someone who created with higher intelligence way above your pay scale that gives an indication that there is an existence of God. And so, so there's this external evidence. And then there's another evidence. It's called the internal evidence. 
And that's called your what? Seven. Yeah, there it is. And so that's about that. So how do we know right from wrong? You know, you may never teach these societies. There may be, and, and if you would, it's in the dark tribes of Africa that, have, that has no, uh, uh, never heard of, of God, and, and yet there's a standard of way to treat people, of not killing some of our students from there. Where do they get that? So there, somewhere there's this internal evidence that we know what is right and what is wrong. Romans speaks of this, Romans chapter 2. Check this verse out. For when the Gentiles, remember the Gentiles, they didn't have the Word of God, they didn't have the law, they didn't have Scripture verses. And so Paul addresses the Gentiles as those that, that have no idea what is right or wrong by the law of God, right? So notice what it says. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature, do what the law requires. By nature, there's that, that inward witness of the conscience. Uh, they are law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness in their conflicting thought, accusing even to themselves. All right, we get the bottom line here. Here's the bottom line. You were born with a moral flashlight. That is, it wants to write a wrong. And secondly, Remember, your conscience doesn't always make you do what's right or wrong. You get that? So here's what that's saying. Basically, your conscience is, is, this, is this flashing light that says, warning, warning, be careful, danger, but it does not make you do what is right or wrong. It's your choice. So, if you are going to say this statement, let your conscience be your guide, then what you're saying is, I'm going to let that warning flash direct how the decision that I'm going to make. That's where we get this all deep, <coughs> misguided myth that allowed that. It's kind of like if you're driving on 12, which is a wonderful not place to drive sometimes, right? You're driving along that two lane, and now they've been watching it a lot. But uh, if you drive along that, that two lane road, and you see a solid yellow line, what does that say? No pass. Now, if you're seeing a double solid line, what does that mean? Nobody, yeah, really, really nobody, or you die, you know? And, and you've seen some stupid people out there. How many of y'all seen stupid people? All right? How many of y'all sitting next, never mind, <laughs> And they pass, and you go, that's a no passing zone, and you did that. You know, you could jeopardize that. Do you know? Here's what that's saying. That, that solid line is saying, be very careful, that that solid line does not determine what you're going to do or not do. Do you understand that? It's your choice. That's the way that it is with our conscious act. All right? Let me use some New Testament words because I want to confuse you even more now. You're not confused. In the New Testament, the word conscious is occurred 32 times. We looked at, let me use some samples of of where we see this in the scripture. Hey, Joe, those scripture verses, you cut those scripture verses out there? Yeah, yeah I'm not going to read it.